Do a little stoichiometry calculation first. I picked easy numbers so you could do that in your head. You know, 10 milliliters of 0.100 molar acid requires 10 milliliters of 0.100 molar base to reach the equivalence point for, you know, uh, for monoprotic acid. You know? So I picked easy numbers so you could easily see where you're at based on the volume of. Uh, um, that's number one. And so, if you know where the equivalence point is in milliliters, then you know. Are you at the equivalence point before the equivalence point or after the equivalence point? You know? And that's how you determine it. As far as pH goes, you would have to know where the pH for the equivalence point is. Is it equal to 7, above 7, or below 7? <coughs> and so if you're given a pH problem where you have to take pH and work to milliliters, then you have to figure out where you are on the titration curve. You know, are you in the buffer region? after the equivalence point, you know, and that's going to dictate the type of calculation you do. And so we did it. Uh, I mean, go back. Did you try the problems we did in class? Yeah. And then um, how did you know we were, how did, how did I know I could use the Henderson-Hasselbach in that region? Yeah, I sketched out the graph because I calculated the equivalence point. And in fact, I didn't calculate it. I asked you guys where the equivalence point is it's supposed to be. Does that make sense? Every single calculation we looked at, at that, um, we, we have to map it out first, roughly, and then see where we are. The titration curve, because each part of the titration curve requires a different type of calculation. The Alternative is, that's the quick way to do it. The alternative way is do every single problem solution dilution. If you do it the long way, then you don't have to worry about where you are. You know? So if all this is confusing, just do it. Step I or step A, solution dilution. You know, and then strongest acid plus weak, uh, strongest base, then you, you won't go wrong. You know, a lot of people, they screw up because they use Henderson-Hasselbach in regions where they're not supposed to use Henderson-Hosselbach it up, you know, those, those people would have been better served just doing it the long way every single problem. You know. Only way, the reason I did that was so you could do it quickly and not finish it. Okay. You can get through it. Okay, uh, 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 other, uh, other questions? You know, when you're doing the, like, you, you have the milliliters, so you do that, and then you have the pKa's, right? Or you should know what the pKa's for the acids are. And you should have a rough idea where the pH is for the equivalence point. You could actually calculate it. It's not a very long calculation. And so you could map out the, the uh, titration curve, or roughly sketch it very rapidly, you know, if you know. You should be able to do that. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Um, on Tuesday, we were talking about sulfides being a yeah. special case. For yeah. Uh, so right. where's the border? There's no border. All sulfides are. No, but of other anions, basic anions, being a special case like that. Well, there are other anions that are special cases, um, uh, but they're they're all fairly soluble, and so we really don't do any KSP calculations because, like sodium amide is a special case. I mean, they'll hydrolyze. The sodium amide is so soluble, we aren't going to do a KSP calculation on that particular salt, you know. And so sulfides are, for the most part, insoluble. And so that's why this is the one and only special case that you'd really worry about. But there are other species that are similar to sulfides, um, like oxides, for example. You know, oxides would do the same thing. If you're trying to do a KSP for magnesium oxide,
If you were doing a KSP for magnesium oxide, it's exactly the same thing. I mean, there's no, there's no border, you know. Magnesium oxide, if you're looking at a KSP equation, it goes magnesium 2 plus plus oxide. This automatically should throw up red flags because you guys know, or at least should start to know the strong bases, right? Oxide is a very strong base. So what's it going to do? Hydrolyze water completely. And so this is not going to happen, right? This would not be, so it's the exact same thing. The KSP would not, no, this is not KSP because oxide would hydrolyze water 100% to hydroxide. And so really the KSP equation should look something like this. Oxide is too powerful a base to just stay in water. Now, we don't have very many oxides. In fact, how many oxides did you see in the KSP chart? This is, you know, this is a difference because a lot of people, they get a chart like a KSP chart, they never look at it. They only look at it when they need to look up a value, right? And then you have those students that look at it. You know, they, they, they look at it and, um, you know, they start to notice things, you know, when they look at it. You know, so you have the people who are totally unfamiliar uh, with the KSP, and then you have those people who kind of know uh, or have some kind of familiarity with the KSP chart. And so, how many oxides did you see on the KSP chart? Has anybody even looked at it enough to even notice, you know, what types of species who are present, you know? like phosphate, sulfide, you know. You, you see, th that's a different level. You know, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you the A students, uh, like UCLA, they would have known. They, they would have looked at that chart quite a lot to, to see. You know, the ones that want the top, top grade. And they they would have, the same thing with the, K, the acid base chart. You know, I, I often ask, you know, <coughs> questions about um, strong bases in Chem 1A. A lot of people um, miss it because you know they think the only strong base there is is hydroxide, you know, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide. So, and so in Chem 1A, I'll throw out an amide or sulfide in there. Yeah. Chem 1B, we should be a lot more familiar with it. Uh, and I think I expect everybody to know those. And so the, to answer your question, you know, when you look at when you look at the KSP chart, that could have answered your question for you because in the KSP chart you would have seen, you know, did you see any other anions that were exceptions like sulfide? No, and therefore, you know, the the probability of seeing something is probably going to be small unless it's like this, you know, analogous type, you know, like oxide, something like that. You know. Oxide. Is there anything else analogous to? This? Uh, no, not really. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, uh, that's just so you you get um, you know, more uh, more comfortable. There's a more comprehensive KSP chart in Appendix D, and there's also a, a bigger K chart right, in Appendix D. And so Appendix those charts, you know, one one when I was a student, one of the professors said to me. You know, the thing that hurts a lot of students is they never read figure captions and they never look at the charts, you know? And he said that that was one of the, the major things that he, that he he would like to tell, you know, me, uh, I, I was just talking to him individually, uh, you know, to, to not do. You know, and then I thought, oh yeah, that, that totally makes sense because they're losing a lot of information. They think all the information is in the text part of the chapter, not in the charts, not in the figures. That, you know, he's saying that if you, can, if you can summarize the charts in your own words, and if you can summarize the figures in your own words, you're going to be a step ahead uh, of your typical student. You know? 
not not that you want you know a lot of people in chem 1a that or chem 4 they come up and ask me should I memorize the activity series no you know definitely don't memorize activities uh, don't memorize any of these charts you know I'm not saying to memorize any charts right but in the activity series you know notice some trends you know the alkali metals are at the top the alkaline earth and then most of the other metals and then you have your noble metals at the bottom you know? and so you can notice these patterns and with those patterns then you can uh, make better judgments you know I, I don't know which is which is more active you know, in terms of the order but I do know, you know, what sits at the top, and, and, and then you, you start thinking, why, you know, why are those much more active than the other species? Okay. And so, to get a, this is what I said. You remember, a lot of people focus on one tree or two trees. Okay, sulfides, yes. You know, what other special trees do I look look for in the forest? You know, but the thing you you should also do is take a look at the whole forest you know take a look at the spectrum to take a look at the spectrum you just look at what are the KSP values they gave you in the in the book you know there there are thousands and thousands of KSP values and what they did was they edited them down to a, a much more smaller number because they think that these are the most important ones you don't need to have a chart that shows every single KSP value that's been determined up to date right and so they pick the most important ones and say, okay, these ones will be useful for you guys, right? And then that's the whole force, that's the whole spectrum of KSP type um, calculations that, uh, that you might encounter. Does that make uh, sense? It, it, you don't have to do this for everything, but... Um, and so do you, you ask yourself this, you know, do you see any other double dagger type things? Did you even see the footnote in the in the KSP chart, I don't know, did they use double dagger for sulfides or did, what did they use for sulfides? And did you read the footnote on the KSP chart? There's a footnote on the KSP chart. All right, but once you get once you get the general feel for this, then you can start thinking. Okay, you know this pretty well, and then you start thinking. If you are hit with something not on the chart, you know, if you're hit on, with something not on the chart, you know, there there are two typ typical responses. I'll tell you, you know, response A. Oh, that wasn't in the book. You know, that's not a fair question because it wasn't in the book and it wasn't covered in lecture. But it, it, it turns out this is actually a very common question. You get stuff that's not on the chart that you see, and what you do is you, you just do something analogous. You know, for example, you know, ammonia is on the chart. Uh, methylamine is on the KB chart, right? But if somebody throws out something like this, which maybe maybe not on the on the chart. You know, somebody throws something like this, you know, would you know what to do? Or would you say, oh, you know. something like this is, um, well, that's it. You know, what you want to do, sorry, what you want to do is you want to start to see, you know, certain patterns in chemical behavior. And then, then you can make predictions just based on simple patterns. And so, yes, uh, these, they're there, but, you know, something like this, well, you know, this would be a base, and it would hydrolyze water just like ammonia or methylamine would. And then write out the equation of the hydrolysis. And so, even though this is just the same as those, it it's, looks different, um, and therefore it really trips up a lot of students. They don't know what to write for the formula for this. And so it would just be ammonium, methyl ammonium, and then this as an ammonium. You know, just add an H, you know, get rid of the lone pair. Um, the ammonium plus the hydroxide. It's just a weird ammonium. Okay. 
I don't know. Was that answering your question, Martha? Okay. All right. Other questions? pattern that you could start to, to look at when you're looking at charts is look for the biggest value and the smallest value on the chart. And then you'll see start to see clusters like, um, it, oh, it turns out that the sulfides are exceptionally insoluble. You know, they have very small KSP. Sulfides tend to be highly insoluble. Whereas some of the other species are a lot more soluble. And then other species show a great, great range of KSP values. That kind of stuff. That kind of stuff, a lot of people say, well, you know, I don't need to memorize or look at any of this because I can always look it up on the chart, right? But the, the problem is, is, yes, you can always look it up on the chart. You, know, you really don't have to have it memorized. But then you can't make any kind of, you know, judgments unless you start to really study it. You know. Judgments meaning, I mean, you know, um, just a simple understanding of any kind of trends or patterns. Anything else from chapter 17? All right, now KSP, the, the, thing, the thing that you also want to do is you, you want to think about, okay, in this chapter, what are we doing? Um, yeah, we're calculating solubility, and we're changing the solubility. What are the ways we can change the solubility? We can change the pH, yeah, make it acidic, make it more basic. It depends on what the salt is. What else? Temperature. Temperature, we're going to talk about in two chapters from now. So all you know is qualitative. Qualitatively, as you increase the temperature, the solubility should increase. What else? Common ion. And One of the most effective ways of increasing solubility is not by increasing temperature necessarily, but hmm? for example, if you had silver chloride and you tried to um, try to heat it up to get it to dissolve, you wouldn't be successful. You, know, you just get it to coagulate by nice and make bigger clusters, crystals. Right, silver chloride, even at higher temperatures, is not very soluble. Is there some other way to get silver chloride to dissolve? Yeah, with the lowest acetate reaction. You could use a big. Yeah, yeah, right. That's that's an excellent way to do it. Uh, <clears throat> we could use a a ligand. Ligand. When I was in. Um, when I was in general chemistry, we were given a research project. You know, the research project was to convert silver chloride into silver nitrate. But I couldn't figure out how to get silver chloride to dissolve because silver chloride was insoluble, right? Silver chloride's insoluble. even at higher temperatures. And then, um, at this point, we hadn't covered complexes yet. And so I was thinking, okay, what about acid? So, I was thinking, okay, I'm gonna try silver chloride with nitric acid to get it to dissolve. This is 
but this would form silver nitrate plus HCl. And so um, I gave up there because uh, uh, this time I knew the leveling effect, right? And that there was no driving force for this reaction. So I was completely stumped. I was completely stumped because I couldn't figure out how to dissolve my silver chloride. And so I just kind of, I, I forgot what I did, but I said once it's in solution, then this is how you could isolate the silver and uh, form silver nitrate. But, the, you know, the problem with my thinking was that, you know, I didn't really know the, uh, the assumptions in this. Like, what were the assumptions here? You know? The assumptions here were that um, the solutions are What were the assumptions in Chem 1A when you're predicting double replacement reactions with this? This is a double replacement reaction. The concentrations are? Hmm? No, not the same. They are the, going to be the same, but the concentrations are what? The assumptions for double replacement are what? This is back in week one. Week one on the PowerPoint, I wrote the, the assumptions for double replacement. Mm -hmm. One molar, right? That's the assumption. This is one. This is for one molar nitric acid. One molar. But you know, so I'm thinking, no reaction. It's not going to happen here. But you know, I had no idea that if you change the concentration, what's going to happen? If you, if you change the concentration, you can make it more. Or less? I should have known the Chalet's principle, huh? I should have known this, but I didn't. Uh, and, and for nitric acid, if we increase the concentration, it should shift it to the to the right. But I had this mental block that this wasn't going to happen because there was no driving force, right? So and no reaction. Well, it, it turns out that the way to get this to dissolve is to use hot concentrated nitric acid. And we actually had to do this um, in lab. And so everybody turned in their little report. Then, then everybody did the same procedure. Dissolve the silver chloride in hot concentrated nitric acid. And it turns out it's not a metathesis reaction, it's a redox reaction. You know, lots of brown fumes come up there. And, uh, the chloride gets oxidized to chlorine in that process. So it, it gets it to dissolve. You know. We have excess nitric acid so from silver nitrate solution and a bunch of others. But anyway, um, so the, the thing is, you know, we can, yes, we have the KSP, we can calculate the solubility, but, you know, we can change things. We can change its solubility with, you know, the common ion. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Well, the same thing with these chemical reactions. You know, if we change the condition, you know, we can actually change the driving force, right? Like say, right now, the driving force for this reaction is in the reverse. You know, precipitation. This is how we precipitated it, right? If we had silver ions. We precipitated with HCl. Without silver chloride, the driving force is in reverse direction. But we can actually change it by um, altering the conditions. And that, but altering the conditions, things like concentration, pressure, temperatures, we're, we're actually going to do calculations for that. We're going to do calculations in um, the next, next chapter. So this is chapter 18, and then we're going to go back to chapter 14, and then we're coming back to chapter 19. So in the next chapter, chapter 19 is when we talk about you know, what happens to the driving force when we start to alter some of these conditions like temperature and whatnot. And, uh, so we'll be looking at this. Yeah. Wait, if chloride was oxidized in that reaction, was nitrate the oxidizer? Nitrate with acid.
So we want to manipulate things. Um, so uh, you know, another easy would have been an easy way to dissolve the. Um, with probably now that I think about it, using hot nitric acid wouldn't have been the wouldn't have necessarily been the um, easiest way. You know, hot nitric acid is very dangerous. You had to do it in the fume hood, and you put a crucible there, you Bunsen burner, and then you just start generating. The whole hood fills up with this black smoke, you know. Actually, it's a, not smoke, it's a brown gas. You know, because the nitrate is oxidized to NO. NO is a colorless gas. The NO is rapidly oxidized in air by O2, and forms NO2, which is a brown gas. Both of these are toxic. But, uh, you know, I was thinking, you know, what would have been an easier way to do this now, after getting PhD in chemistry? <laughs> Uh, a lot easier way to do this is just to dissolve it in ammonia. Dissolve it in ammonia and then kill that complex using nitric acid. And it's silver nitrate right away. Even easy. So, um, it wouldn't have been as fun though because fuming, hot fuming nitric acid is interesting stuff you don't see every day. And so here's a here's a problem I'll leave you with. Okay, here I have um I have one gram of uh, silver nitrate solid. Okay. Yeah we could add ammonia, right? And get this to dissolve. But this is what I want you to do. You know, I don't want to waste any ammonia. I want you to calculate to the drop how many drops of ammonia are going to be required to dissolve one gram of silver chloride. Hmm? Silver chloride. Right. Uh, <laughs> silver nitrate would have been very easy uh, since it's so soluble. What was the question again? Calculate the number of drops. What did you guys use? Six molar or 15 molar? 16 molar. Six molar. Calculate the number of drops of six molar. We'll just do so 6.0 molar ammonia required to dissolve all of the uh, silver chloride solid. So think about that. I'll give you a, a little bit of time to think about how you approach this particular problem.
Yeah. Also, K Uh, all right, did somebody get the get an answer? Yeah. How many? Forty six and a half. Yeah. Um, what, one of the things about this chapter is uh, where do you start? Uh, you know, do you start with the KSP or do you start with the KS? You know, where do you start? For uh, this, it's which is very, very clear. Okay, so you started with the KS? Well, with the assumption that it's and then compares with. <laughs> oh, anyway, uh, the, for the, so it gets, this chapter is a bit more challenging because there are different ways to start problems. You know, some problems, like when we're doing fractional precipitation, you know, we're doing with KSP, you know, and, and QSP and that kind of stuff. Other problems, we're going to be doing KA or KSPF. Did you start with KSPF? Or okay. And so, um, I guess we could do this. Do you want to do this one? If we start off with the KSP equation, what well, usually we do, we got silver and chloride. And then what do we do with it? What can we do with the KSP equation? We can calculate solubility, which lots of people do for this, but is that right? If we were to stop here and calculate the solubility, that would be like the solubility in water. In water. This is not the solubility in water that we're after. So this is the KSP. Then uh, I guess we could start with the KF equation. This KF equation is, perhaps I should have known. You don't have to know this, right? Is how do we know two ammonias rather than four ammonias like in copper? How do you know? The one plus charge. Hmm? The one plus charge, maybe that will clue you in. But is there a way we could predict that? Well, one thing you could do is this. <coughs> you know, you look at the what chart to get more familiar with you look at the KF chart the KF chart is going to tell you the most common complexes you encounter is this something easy to predict no, no I mean Bronsted acid base reaction is super easy to predict because you just take the strongest acid plus the strongest base but is a Lewis acid base reaction so easy to predict? You know, how many ammonias? You know, why does ammonia attack nickel but does not attack aluminum? Can somebody answer that? Why does ammonia attack copper but not magnesium? Yeah, it, that's exactly it, but you don't know, right, right now, how the orbitals are impacted, so you can't really make much judgment call other than to look at the KF chart and then get more familiar. In fact, that's the only way you could do this. Otherwise, you know, you know nothing. You know, you can't really guess. Could you guess? I'm going to ask you to guess. I'm going to tell you, to tell me what complex forms when I take iron 3 and ammonia. What complex forms? How many ammonias? Well, I'd guess six, right? Yeah, I, I'd say six ammonias. Why? Because that seems reasonable. I've seen six before. And I form the hexamine iron three. Now, does somebody have their chart? This, the, I'm locked out of this. Otherwise, I was going to show the charts today. 
Oh, bro. Uh, does somebody have the KF charts handy? All right. Uh, do you see hexamine iron three in the KF chart? No. Why not? This should be common. Iron three is very common. Ammonia is very common. Does anybody see it? How about Appendix D? You're looking at Appendix D, okay, which is more comprehensive, and you don't see it. And so what does that tell you? Yeah, it's not common. This is not. Whereas if you look at uh, nickel, you should see like a hexamine complex for nickel too, or copper for sure, copper, right? Do you see that? And so how do you get more familiar with this? Well, you know, we're at the stage, of course, having a theoretical understanding is best, but we're at this observation phase, you know, this kind of memorization. You aren't going to memorize the chart, but you're just going to look for kind of patterns, and then you see those patterns, then you'll have a much better grip of what's happening with complex formation than most other people, because most other people don't even bother looking at that chart, right? And so you'll, you'll have a much better idea of what types of complex form. Well, silver does form a, a, a complex. In fact, silver forms complex with a lot of things. Thiocyanate, mm -hmm. cyanide. Those are the types of things you can notice. The cyano complex of silver is exceptionally stable. You know, actually, it's, it's, it'd be a lot easier. I, I could use a lot fewer drops of cyanide you know, a lot fewer drops of cyanide than ammonia. But, you know, obviously cyanide is, yeah, extremely toxic, so we don't want to use it. But um, lots of people do. Lots of people use cyanide for extraction of metal ions, metallurgy, or not metallurgy, but mining, that kind of stuff. The cyanide pit. There's a huge cyanide pit. There's a cyanide pit in uh, what is it? In the Mojave Desert. You know, they put a tarp over it. When the wind blows, it can disperse too many cyanide so You can see it if you drive up the 14 on the left side. Well, anyway, uh, going here. Uh, so we have this KF equation. You just use the KF equation. Well, um, Arthur, did you just use the KF equation? Okay, how did you do it? Just using KF equation. Um, well, I, I, you know, I see a lot of people do this. A lot of people will calculate this. They'll calculate this, and they'll say, if I exceed the solubility, I'm going to get precipitation. So they go 0, 0, plus S, plus S, and S and S. So they say, as long as this S does not go bigger than this value, it will not precipitate as a chloride. Does that make sense? The problem with using something like this is I need to dissolve all the silver chloride. That means there's no silver chloride left over here, right? Uh -huh. And so that means that whatever grams, I, I got to have a lot more chloride than this present. Is that, what's your thinking? You're thinking, okay, let's completely ignore this equation here. <coughs> let's go to this. So what did you do, Arthur? Uh, <coughs> assume KF is very Okay. So those, yeah, 100%. 100%. And we have a 2 to 1 ratio of ammonia, ammonia to silver. Okay. And we can get how many moles of ammonia are in per drop. Okay. And how many moles of silver are in 1 gram of silver core. Okay. And so how many moles of silver did you get? 
6.977 times 10 to the negative 4. So you did that over here, 6.977 times 10 to the minus 3 yeah. molar. And so you put it all as complex, 100%. Yeah. Okay. And then what did you get? Uh, mashed up moles of ammonia needed. So you get that. So, okay, mashed up the moles. And so how many moles of ammonia? You need double that. Double this number again? <coughs> Initially? Or uh, equilibrium? Initially. What is the six molar? Is that initial or equilibrium? Initial. That's initial. Uh, um, so we need double this initial. Yeah. All right. Two times six point nine seven seven minus three. How much complex did you have initially? Zero. Zero. But I didn't even use it this short. You didn't use it. Mm -hmm. Oh, what did you do? Step by step. Initial. Initial. I mean, it was kind of intuitive. Intuitive. And so you got, what did you do? You took the KF is equal to? Very, very big. Very, very big? All right. Oh, I see what you did. Yeah. And then you just did the stoichiometry. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Is that wrong? No, not necessarily. Except um, you're assuming that this is zero at equilibrium, right? You know, free silver ion, and then this. Yeah. All right. Okay. I got it. Um, is it wrong? Uh, you got an answer. That's good. Maybe it's a close answer, or fairly close answer, which is good. But it's wrong because, you know, KF is going to have a value, which I, I, I didn't give you. What is the KF value? Did somebody have it? 4.6 times 10 1.6 times 10 to the 7. And so this would not be the equilibrium conditions because we can't have a zero here. But it, it's going to be very small because it's such a big number. And so it's, it's fairly close to what you have. But let's get a more, uh, let's try to get a little bit more accurate answer. So why don't you redo it, uh, continue working on it a little bit. What was KSP for this? Uh, just a, so KSP I think was 1.1 times 10 to the minus. 1.8 times 10 to the negative. 10? 
You guys have it? Huh? 47. 47 point. No, 46.95. 46.95. How did you do yours? Um, I use the KSPF. You use KSPF? Yeah. Okay, so if we go KSPF, without the equation, Then, then, uh, what did you call again here? Zero. Zero. You just use the equivalent Okay, let's look. So I assume that equals one point eight eight. So you call this x. What did you call this? Okay, all silver goes to the solution. So what did you put here? Six point nine seven seven. Ten to the minus three. Over volume. Over volume. Yes. Okay, so moles per volume. This is X over volume? Okay, and then the chloride? <coughs> over V. <coughs> is equal to what?
So um, let's see. So you calculated this, and then you calculated the total mole. Once you got the total moles, then you use the six molar. Yeah, over the six molar. Over the six molar to calculate the milliliters yeah. and figure it out. Okay, and um, you calculated X based on KSPF. The volumes canceled. Yeah. And you got X. Okay, that that works. doing it. An another way of doing this uh, particular problem uh, would be something like this. We have silver chloride solid. There's two ammonias. This is going to give us the dimine complex plus the chloride. And uh, initial, initial ammonia, well, we, we have to figure out Let's just say none of it's dissolved here. And then we want to figure out um, how much. Well, we're going to get, um, what are we going to get here? Plus 2s minus, or actually minus 2s. This should be minus 2s plus s plus s, right? And so this would be the initial plus 2s. Minus minus that's minus that, two plus s plus s. Uh, the ammonia is the, the only thing we're going to have initially, right? And the, the initial ammonia concentration should be what? Six molar. So, this is just a solid with. No, I'm just solid. And so we're just adding uh, six molar ammonia, correct? Six molar ammonia to the solid. And the solid is just solid, isolated. Here, um, you know, uh, we get KSPF. KSPF is just going to be S squared over the initial ammonium plus 2S. Minus 2S, sorry. Which is going to be S squared 6.0 minus 2S. Quantity squared. Then we solve for S. And when we have when we solve for S, then we get the um, the solubility, right? Molar solubility. Um, we solve for S. S is going to be in moles per liter. And then uh, from that, we're just going to assume the volume doesn't change much. And that will, um, if we need to dissolve, let's say, 6.977 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of silver chloride, then this is how many liters we'll have to have. We'll convert that liters into drops. 
Okay, so this is an alternate way to solve it too. But the, the, the point for bringing this out is, you know, you have to look at a lot of different problems to see, you know, because it's not like chapter 17. Chapter 17, all the problems are the same. Chapter 16, they're all kind of the same, you know. In chapter 18, there's more variety and more places to get uh, mixed up and tripped up. And so, you know, uh, looking at a problem like this, then you got to go back and, and then try to look, you know, at the variety of problems that you see and then try to put those into some kind of pattern. It's like, you know, this is exactly like looking at a table like this. You know, you got a big table, you got a lot of data. You know, the data, we, you know, have you ever heard the term data reduction? Yes or, or no? Data reduction is very important in, in science because what you're doing is you're, you're taking this data table, which is huge, and then reducing it into some simple pattern or simple patterns, right? That's called data reduction. And uh, you, you just don't have. And so what we want to do is this. You know, it's like the chart. It's the, 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 it's analogous to the chart in that, you know, the KF, how can you predict iron did not form an amine complex? You couldn't have, right? You just saw the chart. You looked at the chart and you, and you see it. Well, it's, it's the same thing with this problem solving. What we do is, in this particular chapter, you know, in, in this particular chapter, you want to look at a huge number of problems and see how are these problems solved, what approach did they take, right? And then um, look for patterns in that, you know, certain types of problems will, will solve in certain ways. And then you'll have a much better handle on it versus a person who looks at one type of problem and then tries to fit all the problems that they encounter, chapter 18 type problems, into one method, it's not going to work, you know. And so this chapter, be careful with, because you, you get into a, a little bit, two, two things that people really screw up. The two things are, they have no idea where to start. So I get a blank page or a whole bunch of random things. The other thing is, now we got, we have to worry about cubes, you know, fourth power, fifth power, sixth power. No, in, in chapter 16 and 17, the worst it got was the quadratic. And so this chapter, you know, don't, don't, um, well, just uh, expect, expect to have to do a lot more data reduction, you know, in your mind, get a better grasp of it. Seeing a lot of different methods. And so this is this is the final problem I was going to end with. There, there are a lot of homework problems in there you can take a look at to see what kind of variety of problems there are. But you know, this is just one type of problem. There are other problems where, and the book, the book also, look at if you're looking at the solutions manual, look carefully because you know what, what's one thing that we usually do to check our answers? We usually do a double check to make sure that the K with the equilibrium are the same as the K. The book doesn't do that always. And there are some clear cases where you can calculate the K in your head and it doesn't match. You know, and you see, okay, it's impossible. This answer is wrong because a simple double check would have told you. Unfortunately, that answer is in there. You'll see it. But uh, the answer to one of the problems, they're missing a whole bunch of chloride. All of a sudden, they're missing like a half mole's worth of chloride. It just disappeared. How could that be? You know? And so there's certain things that just don't matter. But, you know, those are the types of things you'd like to be able to catch, you know, those, those types of mistakes. But be on the lookout for that. All right, uh, the, that's chapter 18. That's a, the last of the equilibrium. So that's about as worse, as bad as it gets, you know, this chapter. And now we're going to something completely different. But we're going to talk about kinetics and thermodynamics. It's not completely different. I mean, there's a lot of similarities. Kinetics is chapter 
13, 14, and thermodynamics is chapter 18. Well, this is 18, so this is, it's got to be chapter 19. 19. I wanted to cover th kinetics and thermodynamics together. You know, even though they're different topics, totally different topics, so, you know, you'd be fine separating them out. But, you know, in, in certain ways they're related, obviously. Uh, Connectedness deals with the speed of the reaction. Thermodynamics deals with the, the driving force. Normally, if we have a very big driving force, we expect, you know, high speed reaction usually. You know, there's a lot of energetics pushing the reaction forward. But not always. But they're related. In that way. But uh, uh, totally different um, because you could have a big driving force and, and it'd be not a terribly fast reaction. And so we treat these um, as separate topics. You know, separate or related. So if we go back to um, chapter 14 and uh, look at the speed of the reaction. <coughs> we usually measure the speed of the reaction by some kind of change in the, the um, reacting concept. some delta reactant over delta T. And so the speed can be measured by, you know, um, how fast we lose reactant. Delta reactant would be the final reactant concentration minus the initial reactant concentration divided by, you know, T final minus T initial. So when we think about the reacting concentration, the reacting concentration is going to go down, right? That we're consuming reactants in this reaction. And so this comes out to become a negative number because the final reacting concentration is going to be smaller than the initial. We start off with more reactant than we end with. And so to keep this positive, what we'll do is we'll just take the absolute value of this. And, uh, this is called the rate of reaction. Rates are positive. Just by convention. We can also um, determine the rate based on how fast the product builds up. And so it could be delta of the product concentration over delta T. Here we don't have to take the absolute value because when we look at the product, you know, the final amount of product should be bigger than the initial amount of product. Delta T should be positive as well because T final is going to be bigger than T initial. This is the rate of reaction. But what if um, what if stoichiometrically they're different? You know, what if we form product twice the, twice the rate that we consume reactant? You know, what if, what about the stoichiometry? Yeah. yeah, and so what about stoichiometry? Sometimes uh, it goes A goes to 2B. So for every mole of A that gets consumed, we form twice as much product, so the rate of product formation is going to be twice as fast, right? And so uh, what do we do in that case? Um, which one can we call rate of reaction? Actually, um, neither of these really you should call the rate of the reaction, even though it makes sense to call it the rate of the reaction. You know what we're going to call this? Instead, we're going to call this rate of uh, reacting consumption, rate of uh, reactant consumption. And this is going to be rate of uh, product formation.
and so in, in this particular example, uh, A would be consumed uh, at one half the rate of the product formation, or the product would be formed at twice the rate of reactant consumption. Therefore, um, this is what we're going to see in kinetics. In general, we have A, A plus B, B, et cetera. This is going to go to G, G plus H, H. And so we'll look at rate of A consumption. Rate of A consumption is just um, what we'll say is the absolute value of delta A over delta T, et cetera. You know, rate of um, B consumption would be the same thing. Rate of G formation, this, this is just going to be delta G over delta T. We don't need the absolute value here because this should be a positive number. And then we're going to have this thing, you know, the normalized rate of reaction. The rate of reaction is going to be given as this. It's going to be 1 over little a times delta a over delta t which is equal to 1 over, you know, little b, delta b concentration over delta t, which is equal to 1 over, oh, this should be absolute value, 1 over g, you know, delta g over delta t, etc. So this would be kind of the generic rate of reaction here. It's just normalized. We just normalize it so the B is forming twice as fast so you just cut it down to the same rate as A. So those are all equal? Yeah, these are all equal. All equal. Okay. Well, we have two types of, of rates you know, um, that we usually think of. We have something called the instantaneous rate. The instantaneous rate just tells you how fast, at what time, you know, at what instant of time. So just how fast, at uh, what instant of time. And then we have something called the average rate. Average rate. You know, the average, the average rate is just the average over a time period. Many rates are nonlinear, you know. and so let's take a look at an example here. <coughs> We're out of time. Okay, thanks. Stop here. 